one. The way of the prophet or the way is only one. Meaning that the prophetic way is only one way. That there is only one way to Allah, to God. For us to achieve or to receive the blessings which Islam has to offer, we can only achieve those blessings following one single path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah has stressed the importance of following the way, that single way, the way which he refers to as the way of the party of Allah, saying, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ And whoever takes Allah and His Messenger and the believers as supporters, they indeed, then indeed, the party of Allah will be victorious. Indeed, the party of Allah, they are the victorious ones. And no matter how much we research in the Quran and the Sunnah, we will not find any praise for division. Not in the authentic Sunnah. We will not find any praise for division. In fact, wherever we find division described, it is described in negative terms. Either Allah uh, curses those people who fall into division, splitting up their ranks, as in Surah Ar-Rum, 30th chapter, verses 31 and 32, وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ And do not be of the pagans, of those who split up their religion and became sects, each sect rejoicing in that which it has. This is blameworthy. This is speaking ill of division and splitting of ranks. And we find Allah speaking about this splitting leading to weakness and failure, saying in Surah Al Anfal, the eighth chapter, verse 46, Wala tanaza'u fatafshalu. Do not dispute among yourselves and cause your own failure and loss of power. The Prophet ﷺ had said in a hadith narrated by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Indeed those before you from the people of the book divided into 72 sects. And the followers of this religion will split up into 73 sects. 72 of them will be in the fire and one in paradise. Is this praise of division? No. This is implying that division, the process of dividing the love of uh, sectarianism, factionalism, all of this is despised in Islam. However, there are some common hadiths which are quoted in defense of splitting up different groups. 
you know, uh, people following different movements, etc., and each one taking its own path. There are hadiths quoted. Among them, Ikhtilaf Ummati Rahma. The differences among my nation is a mercy. It's commonly quoted in this regard. However, this quote unquote hadith is mawdu'ah. Mawdu'ah meaning it is fabricated. For those of you that attended this past week's course in hadith, uh, usul al hadith or ulum al hadith, you know what mawdu'ah is. Fabricated. Cannot be relied upon. It's a lie falsely attributed to Rasulullah. Another lie is Ashabi can nujum bi ayihim iqtadaytum ihtadaytum. My Sahaba or my companions are like stars. You will be guided by any one of them that you follow. This is again promoting the idea that. If you follow one of them, as long as you're following one, no matter if one goes this way, one goes the other way, you're rightly guided. So it is something praiseworthy. But in fact, this division, the splitting up, is something condemned, not praiseworthy at all. What we find in the Quran is a statement which Allah has the Prophet ﷺ say. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ Indeed, this path of mine is a straight path, so follow it. And on one occasion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that Allah's Messenger drew a line for us in the ground, on the dirt. And he said, this, this straight line which he drew, this is the path of Allah. Then he drew lines going off on either side, like the way the veins of a leaf branch away from the central vein. And he said, these are the paths. On each, on the head of each path is a devil calling people to it. Then he recited that same verse, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبْلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And this is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the other paths as they would separate you from his path, from the path of Allah. Right. In this particular verse from the Qur'an, you notice that when the Prophet ﷺ is made to speak about his path, the term used is Sirati Mustaqiman, Sirati, Sirat, my path, a single path. But when he speaks about the paths of the others, he uses as subul, the paths, the other paths. When, whenever Allah speaks of the way of the Prophet ﷺ, it's described as a single path. Whereas the path of this misguidance is described as a, as a path having many branches in it, many, many different paths. So, this stresses the, the, the concept that there is only one way. And Ibn al-Qayyim had said, this is because the path leading to Allah is only one. And it is what he sent his messengers and sent his books with. And no one reaches him except with this path. Even if people take other paths and try to open every door, these paths will be blocked off and these doors will be closed. And the exception of this is the one path. For indeed, it is connected to Allah and leading to Him. However, the high obstacles on this path causes people to doubt it and abandon it. And those who have strayed from it have not done so except as a result of their liking for uh, multiplicity, their dislike for individuality, the, the 
haste in reaching their goal and cowardice of bearing its long distance. And he said, whoever views the path as being very long, then his pace will become weakened. So there is only one path. And that path is the path which we enter Islam with. It's the same path on which, on the basis of which we enter Islam. When we make our declaration of faith, saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, and that Muhammad was a messenger of Allah. That second part of that declaration of faith is our commitment to that path. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, was a messenger of Allah. What we are committing ourselves to is that the way which Allah has prescribed for us is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and no good deed which we could think of doing has any value unless it is in keeping or in conformity with the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of course there is another condition for that deed to be acceptable to Allah and that is that it is done sincerely for the sake of Allah because if we are doing it only ritualistically as a cultural hand-me-down you know without any life any uh, spirit to it a spirit of belief of submission to Allah then of course it has no value but one cannot just cling on to the spirit and say I'm not going to follow the external you know what is important is the spirit because it is what determines whether a deed is accepted or not ultimately but if that deed is not in conformity with the way of the Prophet Sallallahu then it is also not accepted so it is like the nut or the seed and the coating of the seed right the, this, the essence of that seed is the inner part but the coating the covering protects the inner part you cannot do with one or the other you plant the seed without the coating it dies you plant the coating without the seed nothing is coming right so the two have to be together and Allah tells us commands us in the Quran in so many verses وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا hold on firmly to the rope of Allah all of you and do not become divided the command is for unity and the rope of Allah what is the rope of Allah Ibn Mas'ud said indeed the rope of Allah is the book of Allah and its path and the path is inhabited by devils and they call out O slave of Allah come this is the path in order to prevent people from the path of Allah so hold on to the rope of Allah and that is the book of Allah this is the core of the path this is what we are called to hold on to and of course when we hold on firmly to the book of Allah because you will have some people say we are holding on firmly to the book of Allah and we're not interested in the in the hadith you know the hadith we can't really rely on hadith but we are holding on firmly to the book of Allah this is misguidance because in saying that in claiming that they are not holding on firmly to the book of Allah because Allah says in the Quran Whoever has obeyed the messenger has obeyed Allah. Whatever the Prophet has given you, take it. Whatever he has forbidden you, leave it. How 
can we follow and know what he gave us? How can we obey him if we are not following the sunnah and the had which is brought to us in the hadith? So holding on firmly to the book of Allah, to the rope of Allah, which is the book of Allah, means holding on firmly to the Quran and the sunnah. And we have well-known hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said similar things where he said, for example, uh, in a narration uh, narrated to us by Abdullah ibn Abbas, the straight path is that which Allah's Messenger left us on. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I have left among you two things. If you hold on firmly to them, you'll never go astray. The book of Allah and my sunnah. تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنْ إِنْ تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَنْ تَضِلُّ عَبَدًا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي The book of Allah and my sunnah. And of course, the understanding of the book of Allah itself depends on the sunnah. Allah said in the Quran, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ and I've revealed to you the reminder, the Qur'an, so that you may explain to the people, you Muhammad وسلم, may explain to the people that which was revealed for them or to them. So the path is one of holding on firmly to the book of Allah and to the sunnah which the book of Allah commands us to follow. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, Prophet Muhammad saying, Whoever amongst you lives on after me will see many differences. So you are to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs after me. Hold on to it with your molar teeth and beware of innovated matters for every innovation is bid'ah. Stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs after me. So Prophet Muhammad has stressed that in understanding his sunnah, we must also hold on to the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs who came after him. The rightly guided caliphs being primarily the leading companions, his leading companions. That generation that uh, the leaders of that generation who lived the revelation. The Quran was revealed amongst them. The Prophet Muhammad lived amongst them. He was the example. And one of the scholars of the past, Ibn Battah, had said, the first generations remained united on this, all together, united upon closeness of the hearts and agreement of methodology. This is because the Book of Allah was their protection and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was their Imam, their leader. They did not use their own opinions nor did they turn to their desires in understanding and applying the religion. So the hearts of the people who were upon this remained safeguarded with Allah's protection and the souls remained shut off from the whims by Allah's help. And may Allah have mercy on him. He indeed spoke the truth. For the religion of Allah is only one without differences. This is the straight path. This is the one path which leads to Allah. And this is in contradiction to all those who would call us to a multiplicity of paths. Whether it is in a general sense, and you will hear people saying, all religions are one. Yeah. There's one God and all the religions are one. They are like spokes on a wheel and Allah is the hub. So it doesn't matter which one you follow as long as you're sincere. As long as you sincerely follow. So whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're Christian, Catholic, Protestant, you know, whatever you are, Muslim, it's all the same. As long as you're sincere, just be sincere in your belief in God. And that will take you to God. Of course, this is rejected. 
Allah did not reveal many religions. There is one human race with shared characteristics, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional, shared characteristics. Allah sent prophets with one message. He didn't send them with a variety of messages. As Allah said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ We sent to every nation a messenger calling them to worship Allah alone and to avoid the worship of false gods. One God, one human race, one message brought by the messengers. There were many messengers because, of course, human race is spread over the earth. So a number of messengers were sent, but they all carried one message. Meaning, they only brought one religion. That's why Allah said, Inna dina in the lahil Islam. That the religion in the sight of Allah, which is acceptable to Allah, is Islam, nothing else. So all of these others are misguidance. No matter how sincere people may be in following them, they are sincere in misguidance. There is only one way to Allah and that is Islam. Islam as was brought by Prophet Adam, Prophet Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all of the other prophets who we don't even know their names. They brought one religion. And whatever exists in the world today of other religions, these are deviations, these are corruptions, man-made uh, ways of life which are not in keeping with the message that was sent by Allah to humankind. So as there is only one religion, as there is only one religion, and all of these other religions are false, there is not more than one way to Allah, it's just one way. Similarly, that one religion is itself one, not with many different paths. We have Shia Islam, and the Shia Islam could be Buhri Islam, or it could be Aga Khani Islam, or it could be, you know, uh, Imami Islam, or whatever, all the different versions. No. Prophet Muhammad left behind one Islam. His companions understood one Islam. And that is the Islam that we need to follow. Even the issue of the schools that we live today, where people follow different schools of law. If these schools of law are looked at as efforts of the scholars to try to uh, understand and to apply the Quran and the Sunnah that one way, which is what it was, this is what Abu Hanifa was doing, this is what Imam Malik was doing, this is what Ahmed ibn Hanbal was doing, this was what Imam Shafi were doing, they're all trying to apply the Quran and the Sunnah to life, daily life, the working out the laws, applying, trying to help people to understand how to apply the laws. This is what they were doing. But where people turn these now into sects, where people will actually refer to their madhab as my sect, which reached the level where, as I have mentioned before in lectures, you had four different prayers going on around the Kaaba. It reached that state of deterioration where Muslims conducted four different prayers for each prayer in Mecca. When the time for Salat came, those people who were making Tawaf, who were Malikis, they would line up when the Adhan was after the Adhan was given, the Iqam was made, they would line up behind the Maliki Imam and they would finish their prayer. When they were finished, 
Then the Shafi Imam would stand and all the Shafi's who were making tawaf would come and line up behind him and pray. And so on behind the Hanafi and behind the Hanbali. Muslims had reached that point. Reached the point where in the Hanafi madhab it was ruled that it was not permissible for a Hanafi to marry a Shafi. Is this what the Prophet Muhammad left behind? No. This is not what the Prophet left behind. This is something of people's making. People made this. People created this. This was not the religion of Rasulullah. This is misguidance, misunderstanding. And if you listen to the statements of the scholars, the early scholars with regards to this, you will see that this was not their way of thinking at all. For example, Imam Malik was asked, I heard, uh, one of the students of Imam Malik said, I heard Imam Malik and Imam al who was the Imam in Egypt, both say the following concerning the differences amongst the Sahaba. People say there is leeway for them in it, but it is not so. It was a case of wrong and right rulings. People say there's leeway, meaning it doesn't matter which of the Sahaba you follow, no problem. No. Those Imams said no. Some were right and some were wrong. And if you know what is the right and what is the wrong, then you must follow the right. That is your responsibility. Ashab, another of Imam Malik's students said, Imam Malik was once asked whether one was safe to follow a ruling related to him by reliable narrators who heard it from the companions of the Prophet He replied, no. By Allah, not unless it is correct. The truth is one. Can two opposing opinions be simultaneously correct? The opinion which is correct can only be one. So when we look at issues of schools, of law, etc., we have to look at them in the light of right and wrong. We cannot say they are all correct. And this is a common saying. People say, you must follow a madhab. If you don't follow a madhab, your imam is shaitan. This is a common phrase. You hear this amongst people who are very much into madhab. So much so, that I remember reading in one book, uh, where the author put, said that, you know, when Munkar and Nakir will come and ask you in the grave, what is your religion? What is your prophet? What was the religion you followed? And he will also ask, Wama madhabuk? And what was your madhab? This is a lie. Fabrication. A lie. You know, because people are so locked into this thing. But the reality is that these schools, every one of them contain errors. They were the efforts of human beings, and as such, they're imperfect. So for anybody to say, I am going to follow this one blindly, this is a person who has not understood Islam. The only person that we follow blindly is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was the shahada. When we said, wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, that was our declaration stating that we would follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam blindly. Meaning, if he told us to do something and we didn't understand the reason behind it, we would still go ahead and do it. Any other human being tells us to do something, we need to know the reason. We don't just go and do it blindly. No, we ask him why. We'll try to find out why. Now, there are things which Prophet ﷺ told us, which Allah told us, where the reason is discernible. We can determine it. Or Allah has mentioned it. The Prophet ﷺ has explained why. But there are also certain things which they have told us to do and there is no explanation. No explanation given. So what do we do? This now comes to our belief. If we believe that Allah is Allah and that Muhammad ﷺ was the messenger of Allah, then we will follow their instructions even if we don't understand why. That is submission. And that submission is only due to Allah. We do it to what the Messenger has told us, 
because in doing it to what the messenger told us we are doing it to Allah not because we're submitting to Muhammad sallam, no that is a mistake to think that we are submitting our wills to Muhammad sallam. no we are submitting our wills to Allah we submit our we submit our wills to Allah by following what Allah has said in the Quran and what Allah has said through Muhammad sallam in his sunnah because the sunnah the hadith conveyed to us revelation as Allah said in the Quran وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He did not speak from his own desires what he told you was revelation which came to him so that's why we submit and in submitting to what Prophet Sallallahu has told us we are in, in submission to Allah مَنْ يُتِعَ الرَّسُولُ فَقَدَ طَاعَ الله. Whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah so when we look at the instructions with regards to following the, the Sunnah and the way of the Prophet Muhammad and, and the uh, companions we find a number of hadiths as I mentioned before where we're, and we're told to follow the way of the Prophet and his rightly guided caliphs to avoid innovation etc and at the same time we find in the practice of the Sahaba themselves you know an opposition as I said to any kind of uh, disagreement amongst themselves uh, we find for example uh, disagreements where people are going to opinions and not following the Sunnah we find for example a statement uh, Orwa Ibn Zubair Orwa uh, once said to Ibn Abbas Woe be unto you, you are sending people astray. You are instructing them to make Umrah in the ten days before Hajj. And there is no Umrah then. Umrah is not permitted then. Abdullah ibn Abbas said to him, Go ask your mother. Go ask your mother. And he said, Abu Bakr and Omar, they didn't say what you're saying. And they have more knowledge of Allah's Messenger. And, are more, and they are more firm in, in keeping to his sunnah than you are. Ibn Abbas replied, so this is where you are coming from. I tell you what Allah's Messenger has said. And you come to me with what Abu Bakr and Omar said. Woe be to you. Are, there, are they more preferable to you or what is in Allah's book and the sunnah of his messenger which was left among his companions and his ummah? I see them falling into destruction. I say Allah's messenger said and he says Abu Bakr and Omar forbade. I say even on the level of the companions themselves some of them based on knowledge which they had they made certain decisions and in the end what do we do with those decisions you know for example you know uh, Omar radiallahu anhu he ruled that the stating of three divorces uh, one after the other will be held as three divorces but Prophet Muhammad said when a man came to him and said I divorced my wife the number of times there are stars in the sky he said that's one divorce he said that's one divorce okay. this was the Sunnah the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad and when he said follow my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the, the Khulafa Rashidin he didn't say follow my Sunnah and a rightly guided caliph because we had four but he said the rightly guided caliphs meaning what they all agreed on not what one or two held but what they all agreed on so we are obliged to follow what came uh, in the sunnah which was agreed upon by the followers of the Prophet Muhammad and the following and the understanding of 
what Islam is, what the Quran and the Sunnah was, is the understanding which they held. As Allah said, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا And whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has been made clear to them and follows a way other than that of the believers, I will leave him to his choice and place him in hell, an evil end. And follows a way other than that of the believers. Who was that verse referring to when it was revealed? It was referring to who were the believers then? The companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Following a way other than the way which they went, they followed. That is misguidance. Guaranteed misguidance. And in another uh, narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said that uh, the Christians would be the Jews would be divided up into 71 sects, the Christians into 72 sects, and he said, you and my nation will be divided into 73 sects. He went on to say, uh, and only one is in, in, in paradise, and the companions asked him, which one is that, O Messenger of Allah? And he said, the one which I am on, and you are on. The one which I am on, and you are on. So, Understanding the way of the Prophet Muhammad is through the understanding of his companions, not according to how we in our times may interpret things. You know, for example, today one uh, sister came and asked me about wearing niqab, that she had decided to wear niqab, and her parents were both. Religious, religious people, they were opposed to her tooth and nail. The father was saying, the mother it was from the point of view of marriage prospects. She said, well, you know, if you're wearing niqab, then how are we going to find somebody to marry you? Right? Nobody can see you, nobody, you know, this, is the, this was her rationale. She was looking at it more on the emotional level, right? Uh, marriage. Whereas the father was saying, no, this niqab is Arab culture. It is from the Arab, you know, cultural practices. It's not Islam. In fact, you are being extreme in wanting to do this. This is the modernist understanding. And you'll hear it echoed. The point is that the wearing of the niqab was done in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu It's not to say it was compulsory for all the women. It was compulsory for his wives because their case was special. They could not marry anyone after Prophet Muhammad when he died. And to help to remove any possibility of people developing any kind of feelings and desires for them and vice versa, etc., they were veiled from the people in general. But the, many of the women who were around Prophet Muhammad's wives, they also covered themselves wearing the niqab, etc. And this is why you can find in the hadith concerning Hajj, where Prophet Sallallahu had said, you know, for women, when they were going for Hajj, that they should not wear niqab or gloves. The fact that he's telling them not to wear niqab meant that they were wearing niqab, that it existed amongst them. So it was a part of what was approved by the Prophet Sallallahu And it is something commendable. It is something recommended. It is something which Islam not only approves of, but also honors. Right? So to refer to it as being Arab culture, this is misguidance. Now this is modern interpretation, right? And of course, there may be aspects which were, we could say, localized. The idea of wearing black. Now, wearing black, we cannot say that the religion says women should wear, their, wear black. That this is what they have to wear. That is, and that was common to Arabia. That was the preferable color which they used. And as people from Arabia, Muslims spread to different parts of Muslim lands, they carried that with them. But in reality, Islam does not prescribe that a woman wear black. 
It could be brown, it could be green, but in whatever, the colors are preferable though. There are darker colors in the sense that they should not be uh, eye-catching, like bright yellow, bright red, you know, flashy flowers and colors and, you know, because the whole idea of trying to discourage, you know, people staring and being attracted and things like this is lost by, you know, wearing garments which become equivalent to the garment that you're supposed to be covering with your outer garment, right? So, these kind of interpretations, you know, these uh, we have to be aware of and know that the only way to interpret and to understand the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is to understand it as the companions had. And we have an example from the life of Imam Ahmed, who was jailed because of his uh, opposition to those who were claiming that the Quran was created right? and that Allah was everywhere. In any case, he was brought before the Caliph and he deb debated with one of those who were promoting these deviant ideas at the time. And he said to the person, when the person was the representative of this innovative, innovative views, he said, inform me about this matter which you are calling people to. Is it something which Allah's Messenger called people to? Huh? His claim that the Quran was created, Allah is everywhere. Could you find any hadith? Is there something in hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said this? He told people, come and believe this. The innovator said, no. Imam Ahmed then asked him, is it something that Abu Bakr Siddiq called people to after him? Or Omar ibn al-Khattab, or Uthman, or Ali? He said, no. So he said, so it is something that neither Allah's Messenger, nor Abu Bakr, nor Omar, nor Uthman, nor Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all, call to. Yet you are calling people to it. It is not then unreasonable for me to say that they either knew this matter or they were ignorant of it. Either they were aware of this or they were ignorant of it. If you say that they were aware of this matter yet they remained silent, does that make sense? That they knew this, this is the correct belief, the correct understanding, but they remained silent? That is obvious, obviously wrong. And if you say that they were ignorant of it, but I know it, then, O oh wicked son of a wicked one, the Prophet ﷺ and his rightly guided caliphs were unaware of something, yet you and your friends know about it. You know, this is the claim when a person innovates in the religion, whether he introduces celebration of the Prophet ﷺ's birthday, you know, or whatever other innovated uh, practice, celebration of the, you know, the uh, New Year with the Hijra, you know, New Year celebrations, other, these other kinds of celebrations that people have introduced amongst themselves, what in fact are they saying? They're claiming basically that they know something that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions didn't know. Or they knew about it and they hid it. One or the other. But Prophet Muhammad said, Taraktukum ala mahajjatin bayda. Leiluha kanaharihah la yazigu anha illa halik. I've left you on a clear white slate whose night is like its day. And no one deviates from this except is destroyed. The religion is clear. The night of the religion is like the day of the religion. No difference. Night and day, usually we use this as a metaphor for the opposites. The night is, this thing is like, the difference between them is like day and night, we say. But in Islam, there's no difference. The day is like its night. And whoever deviates from this path is destroyed. This is the clarity. This is the religion of Islam. And somebody may say, okay, I'm not trying to bring anything Prophet didn't do. 
but what I'm doing is something which is good. It's a good thing. We'll call it bid'ah hasana. A good bid'ah. Right? Because, you know, it is good for us to remember Rasulullah on his birthday. You know, this makes us closer to Allah. You know, it reminds us about Allah, reminds us about the message which the Prophet brought. So this is a good thing. How can you say we shouldn't do it and it's a good thing? Well, Prophet Muhammad said, ما تركت شيئاً يقربكم إلى الله إلا وأمرتكم به. I have not left anything which will bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. He said that, meaning that you cannot find anything today which will bring you closer to Allah, which Prophet ﷺ didn't tell us to do. If you found something, it's not bringing us closer to Allah. That's what this means. Just as Imam Malik said, on the day when the verse was revealed, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, right? Today, the religion has been perfected or completed for you. He said, whatever was not religion on that day can never be religion. Whatever was not a part of the religion of Islam on the day when that verse was revealed can never ever be religion. That is the correct understanding. And this was the way of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad And what we find Allah saying in Surah An-Nisa, the fourth chapter, verse 59, Allah there says, وَإِن تَنَازَعَتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا And if you dispute in any matter, then return it to Allah and His Messenger. If you indeed believe in Allah and the last day, that is better and more suitable for determination. Where we have differences, where we have different opinions, etc. And this is natural. We as human beings will never escape differences. Differences will remain amongst us. But the question is, how do we resolve our differences? What do we do with these differences? Do we say, you have yours and I have mine, you go your way, I go mine? Yeah. As Allah described in the very beginning, describing those who uh, become like the kuffar, كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Every sect or every group is happy with what he has. He goes his way, he goes this way. I have mine, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to do. I've got mine. No. Allah tells us here that when we dispute, we have to take it back to Allah and the Messenger. This is the way in which we resolve the differences amongst us. Now, we do have a number of different organizations which function within the Muslim world today. Whether it's Jamaat-e Islami, Jamaat Tabligh, the Ikhwan al Muslimin, Nursi movement, whatever, we have a bunch of different groups. And these groups have leaderships. And the leaderships call people to make bay'ah to them. To give oaths of allegiance, to follow. Follow them, you know, all the time. Come hell or high water, they say. You follow them. The sunnah, the way of the companions, was that bay'ah was only given to the Khalifa, the head of the Muslims, not to any Omar, Khalid, Hassan who pops up. He says, I've got a group. I got the best way. Make bay'ah to me and follow my way. No. There is a hadith narrated by Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. He said, the people used to ask Allah's Messenger about the good, but I used to ask him about the evil, lest I should be overtaken by it. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, volume 9. 
So I said, O oh Messenger of Allah, we are living in ignorance and in a bad atmosphere. Then Allah brought us this good, Islam. Will there be any evil after this good? And he said, yes. I said, will there be any good after that evil? He replied, yes, but it will be tainted. I asked, what will be its taint? He replied, there will be some people who will guide others, not according to my tradition. You will approve of some of their deeds and disapprove of others. And I asked, will there be evil after that good? And he replied, yes. There will be some people calling at the gates of hell. And whoever will respond to their call will be thrown into the hellfire. And I asked, O Messenger of Allah, will you describe them to us? He said, they will be from our own people and will speak our language. I said, what do you order me to do if such a state should take place in my lifetime? He said, stick to the jama'ah, the main group of Muslims and their imam. Hmm? Who is that? The ruler, the khalifa, amirul mu'mineen. So I said, and if there is neither a group of Muslims, Muslims are all scattered up, splintered up into all these different countries with nationalities and everything else, nor an imam, a khalifa, to whom all of the Muslims can rally. He said then, فَاعْتَزِلْ تِلْكَ الْفِرَقَ كُلَّهَا Then turn away from all of these sects, even if you have to bite the roots of a tree till death overtakes you while you're in that state. This is the guidance. This is the statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is this telling us in practical terms? It's telling us not to commit ourselves to any organization which seeks to divide itself from the mass of Muslims. This is what it's telling us. It's not telling us don't organize, don't try to do things in an organized way. This is the Discover Islam Center here. You know, I don't stand up and say, hey, we need to close down the center now. You guys are, <laughs> you know, don't do anything. No, this is not a group seeking to divide itself from Muslims. I am the director. I'm not calling people to make bay'ah to me. No, <laughs> okay. This is just a, a means of organizing da'wah activities. We come, we go, I come, other people can come. You know, this is not, it is just an organization to try to do things in an organized way. That's all. But where that organization transforms itself into a movement where you now have a leader who calls people to give the oath of allegiance to him, where now you're going to follow and then you start to look at people who are not a part of your group with the, what they call the us and them mentality. You know the us and them mentality? If you're not with us, then you're against us. Right? That looking at people with doubt because what we're on this is the right thing anybody who's not with us making the bayah along with us they are off they're misguided right? and you'll hear that in ignorance you have some people who say when they do their Islamic work they call it fi sabilillah the path of Allah we're on the path of Allah so you might be going to make jihad and they will ask you have you gone out fi sabilillah? So I'm going to make jihad. No, I said, did you go out for 40 days? I mean, <laughs> hey, hey, you know, they have turned 40 days now into fi sabilillah. If you're not doing these 40, you're not fi sabilillah. This is misguidance. This is misguidance. The way of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, that is the way. What they understood fi sabilillah to be, that is fi sabilillah. The way in which they conducted da'wah, conveying the word of Allah to the people, the non-Muslims, the people in their communities, people outside the community, that is the way to do it. And any other way is doomed 
to failure. Failure, not necessarily meaning they will have few followers, because an organization may have millions and millions of followers. They may be very huge and, you know, but is the issue one of numbers? If the issue were one of numbers, then we would have to say, Muslims are astray. Right? Because they are not the majority on the earth. Some people will ask, since Islam is the right way, why aren't the most of human beings Muslims? <laughs> right? You know, they can't argue from that point of view. If most of the Muslims are going to the graves and praying to the saints, and only you guys, Wahhabis, you know, Ali Hadith, you know, any other what they consider to be a dirty name they can throw on you, right? You don't want to go to these uh, the shrines, you don't want to honor the saints. Everybody else is doing it. If the issue were numbers, then we'd have to say they are right. right? So the issue is not the issue of numbers. There's never been an issue of numbers. The issue is concept. If the concept is correct, even if only one person is following it, as Allah referred to Prophet Ibrahim as a ummah, all by himself. The whole of his people, everybody were into idol worship, but he alone was off. And he was right. So, it is important for us to consider the way the way of Prophet Muhammad sallam, that that way was one way there are no two ways about it of course within that way there may be variation in the sense that in prayer one may raise one's hands to the ears or one may raise one's hands shoulder height Prophet Muhammad sallam, did both. So within that way, there, are, there is variation. And wherever Prophet Sallallahu has given us variation, we are free to follow any of the variants. But in the variation, there is still one way. Because even though we may be following some of the variants, each one of those variants represents a part of that way. So, my brothers and sisters, let us reflect on how much or to what degree we are in fact following that way knowing that it is the only way to Allah it is the only way to success it is the only way to paradise inshallah that is the or oh, that is what I wanted to share with you this evening um, if you have any questions now, we can look at your questions. And hopefully the questions will be on the topic, you know, where we can further elucidate